be, before I start, I just read a message that says people cannot see the, my video. Is that actually correct? Okay. All right. So it's, it sounds like a, a, a few people cannot see me, but mostly it's just under. Okay. Hi, under. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm extremely uh, uh, honored to be here. Uh, so, really, terrific initiative uh, by Life and Andreas. Ah, tienes razón. ¿Sabes lo que puede haber sido? Que lo dibujó la misma persona. Okay, I muted him. We can, I can also not see you, actually. Ah, okay. So, a few people cannot see me. Uh, can anybody see Nathaniel? Oh, many people can see you. Okay, good. Right. Okay, okay, okay. 200 people said yes. <laughs> yes, I can see. Go ahead. So, okay, it's not clear why some people can see me, but uh, why some people cannot. So, I think the important bit is that you can listen to me. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how to ask the question whether you can hear me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, life, do you want to ask if there are some people? Uh, who can not hear me? Anybody cannot hear Nathaniel? I just need to resize the screen. I don't know how to resize oh, it. Oh. oh, wonderful. Perfect. Yeah, just resize the screen. Resize okay. the screen. Do I have to? I think now everybody can see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Giovanni says that he cannot not hear me. Okay, uh, I think that's that's a pretty good sign. I don't have to do anything. Excellent. So I'm I'm extraordinarily pleased to be here. It really is an honor, and um, uh, I, I I think uh, this initiative by Life and Andreas is absolutely terrific. And I I'm so happy that they they thought of organizing something like that. It's going to be I think a great tool. Uh, for all of our community in, in the, not only in the month ahead, but I hope in many years in the future. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, some very recent work. In fact, it was posted on the archive just, uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, this is work, uh, joint work with uh, Yuan Guain uh, from the University of Cambridge. And uh, this is going to be about random walks on random planar maps and uh, something called UVL brown in motion. Um, the first thing uh, to begin with, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, give you a bit of motivation. It starts with uh, a wonderful and, and remarkable paper of uh, Itai Benjamini and Nobde Tram uh, from 2001, uh, where they asked basically the following question, what does a random walk on a random planar map look like? And uh, the kind of planar maps that they had in mind are the ones that you can see uh, on this slide here. Uh, this is something called, uh, well, it's something related to the UIPT. This is uh, the, the kind of random planar maps they had in mind, uh, introduced by Omer Angel and Ode Tram roughly around the same time. And uh, it's not going to really matter for the rest of the talk, but for those of you who uh, know about this model, it's called the UIPT. It's a very beautiful uh, model of a random planar map. Um, and um, uh, what, what this is, is really just uh, the local limit of random triangulations with n faces as n tends to infinity. So we should imagine uh, the limit of this picture that we see on the slide when the number of ace faces n tends to infinity. And the, the reason why uh, they oh, Nathan, started... Sorry to interrupt. People cannot see the entire slide, probably because um, all the options of Zoom take away the bottom. So uh, perhaps it's better if you don't go for full screen mode. Let's try this way. Does, is that better? No, it's still too big, at least on, for me. Better? Is that better for everyone? Is that better for oh, you, Life? No, it's uh, people st not really, so it's still a bit too where, big. Where, where does it cut at the moment? Uh, Ambion. So the first uh, row is there. I see. Uh, it's just one line is missing, and maybe the best is it, it does go a little bit 
it is it is looking a bit full on the slide, but uh, uh, oh, okay. It seems to be different for different people. Okay, uh, we are learning about this technology, obviously. Yes. Uh, so, note for future speakers: try to not make your slides too full. <laughs> uh, Julien says, "Unzoom." Can you unzoom? Can I unzoom? Yes. Mm, yeah. With a minus in your at the top of your window. Yeah. This way, I'm sure some people, most people, will be able to see it now. I hope. So uh, now it's better. Yeah. Okay. So the the, the reason why uh, Benjamin Ishram considered uh, this kind of question had to do with uh, non-rigorous works from uh, mathematical physics, uh, basically uh, work of Ambion and Watabiki, roughly around the same time, non-rigorous, of course, in which they claim that. Uh, uh, so let me put it in quotation marks: the spectral dimension of uvil quantum gravity should be two, meaning basically that uh, uh, if you're considering, uh, if you're working, uh, if you're looking at random walk on this kind of graphs and you, you're asking uh, what is the chance that your random walk is back to its starting point after time t, then as t tends to infinity, it should decay in the same way as it would in two dimension, meaning it would decay roughly as, a, as one over t. And uh, the, you know, one over t is of course something that you you know, if you sum it, you get infinity. And uh, so it, it led them to to conjecture that uh, uh, UIPT, this this limit of uh, of random triangulation with n faces as n tends to infinity, should be a recurrent uh, graph almost surely. And they couldn't quite prove that, uh, but they proved something very related to that. They they proved. Uh, uh, the fun following fundamental theorem, which really uh, spurred a lot of work uh, following, following this paper and initiated a, a very successful program uh, of research. Uh, and the, 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 the result of the theorem says that subject to a bounded degree, any local limit of a sequence of planar maps rooted at a randomly chosen vertex is going to be recurrent. So, uh, the UIPT does not have the property that is bounded degree, but it's very close uh, to that. It, in fact, there is a, an exponential tail on the degree of a, a randomly chosen, you know, uniformly chosen vertex the root. And uh, so, so this strongly suggested that this conjecture was correct. And in fact, uh, this this uh, uh, problem was was famously solved in a paper of uh, Orel Gorevich and Asaf Nachnias in 2013. Uh, where they show that indeed an exponential tail on the root, uh, on the degree of the root suffices, and in particular, uh, the UIPT is recurrent. So, for uh, this is not going to be, you know, the, the core uh, of what I'm going to talk about in this talk, uh, but it is, you know, nice to have in the back of your mind, perhaps. And uh, for people who are interested, I would strongly recommend taking a look at Asaf Narmia's uh, Saint Flor lecture notes for a recent survey. So this talk won't really be about these results. It will be about a related question. Really, it will be about uh, scaling limits of random walks on such graphs, on such planar maps. Uh, so uh, there's two things I want to do in this talk. The first thing is to tell you about what is the, the, the candidate for the scaling limit. This is going to be the Luville Brown in motion from the title of my talk. And then I want to tell you about a result where we prove some scaling limit result for a uh, random walk uh, on a class of planar maps. And this class of planar maps uh, will be maybe intuitively related to the UIPT, but will not actually include uh, the UIPT. And that's why you don't really need to know what is the UIPT for this talk. Uh, I will describe this mo this, uh, these maps in more detail later on. Okay, so my first task is going to tell you a little bit about uh, the candidate for the scaling limit. And uh, to do that, I need to tell you a little bit about uh, something called the DDK ANSATS, which is something that came in the physics literature. And really it was explained to the uh, probability community in a landmark paper uh, by uh, Bertrand Duplanty and Scott Sheffield roughly 10 years ago. And uh, this ANSATS uh, roughly says the following. It says that the, the metric, the, these random walks, this, excuse me, these random planar maps should be related to a random geometry in the plane uh, where the metric should be uh, taking the following form. 
it's, uh, so this is a bit of the metric and it should be proportional to the exponential of gamma, where gamma is a parameter, times h, where h is a Gaussian free field, I will uh, come back to that in a second, uh, multiplied by the standard uh, Euclidean metric. And uh, maybe the, the best way to, to think about what that means, what that might mean intuitively, is that if you take uh, uh, a small uh, disk of area epsilon, uh, in measured, you know, measured according to the Euclidean metric, then really this should correspond to a number of triangles on your planar map uh, proportional to e to the gamma h times epsilon locally at the point. So uh, maybe this is still a bit vague for the moment. I will uh, go in a bit more detail in a second. Uh, so first of all, what is uh, the Gaussian free field? Uh, maybe uh, many of you are familiar with it, but maybe uh, some of you are not. Um, you should think of the Gaussian free field as a random uh, function going from some given domain D into the complex plane. It's a very canonical uh, object. Uh, I put function in quotation mark because actually it's not defined point-wise. Uh, rather, it's a random distribution, meaning that what's well defined is uh, local averages of the Gaussian free field. So what does make sense is to integrate h against the test function f, and then by definition, what you get is a Gaussian random variable with mean zero and variance sigma squared, where the sigma squared is given by this formula, the double integral of the Green function gxy, times f of x, f of y, dx, dy. And g, as I said, is the green function in the domain d. Um, so this formula, uh, the way you should think of it is that uh, it says that basically, well, the Gaussian free field is not a function, but if it were a function, then its pointwise values would be Gaussian random variables with mean zero and the covariance given by the green function g, x, y. And, uh, as many of you know, in two dimensions, the green function uh, explodes on the diagonal. So when y uh, uh, converges to x, then gxy blows up logarithmically, in fact. And that's another way of saying that the, the pointwise variance is infinite, meaning that you cannot assign values to, the, to this function pointwise. Uh, but again, what really makes sense is to integrate h against the test function f. So you get a random distribution. So, uh, you know, th this formula, this is an ansatz from physics, and it's not so clear uh, uh, how we can really make sense of it. Uh, really, the, the, the core difficulty, if you want, is that H, as I just said, is, is not pointwise defined, but rather is a distribution. So you cannot easily uh, exponentiate a distribution uh, because it's not clear, you know, what that means. So we, one way to think about this problem is that h uh, is well defined when you integrate it against test function. And that really is because there are, uh, when you do this integration, when you take a local averages uh, of the field on some given region, you can think that there are lots of plus and minus infinities that cancel each other. But when you take the exponential, then there's no reason for this uh, cancellation to take place anymore. And so it's not clear at all what exponential of the Gaussian free field uh, can mean at all. Uh, so, uh, you know, mathematically, uh, the, the problem, if you want, is the following. We know what is uh, the Gaussian free field H, but it's not so clear what uh, uh, exponential of the Gaussian free field might mean. And there are really three uh, types of objects that uh, one might want to make sense of. Uh, the first one, as I said, is, is the metric, really. Uh, can you measure curves in a way that uh, the length of curves in, in, in a way that depends on this uh, Gaussian free field, and you want to sort of integrate exponential of gamma times the Gaussian free field along the curve. In reality, it's a bit more complicated than that, but let's not get into this uh, complication for now. Uh, likewise, another object that you might want to make sense of is the volume measure. So that would be uh, integrating exponential uh, of gamma times the Gaussian free field times dz on some given set. So that's a way of assigning random areas to, to, to sets in the, in the plane. And finally, the third object uh, that one might care about uh, is a diffusion. So a Brownian motion uh, on this uh, surface. And as you can imagine, for me, for this talk, uh, I will try to insist more on the diffusion uh, aspect of things because I care about this uh, Liouville Brownian motion. That's one of the goals of this talk to tell you about it. 
but uh, uh, I will tell you a little bit about uh, some of the other objects. So uh, the situation uh, today is extremely fortunate uh, because in fact, all these uh, three objects uh, have been made sense of. Uh, the first one to be constructed and the easiest to explain is the volume measure. I will uh, tell you a little bit about it in the, uh, the next few slides. Uh, the diffusion was the next uh, thing that was constructed. And very recently, uh, the metric uh, associated to the exponential of the Gaussian free field was constructed. This is uh, a, a series of six papers that appeared all on the same day on the archive. That was really quite amazing. Uh, five of which written by uh, uh, Ewan Gwine and Jason Miller, and a sixth one written by Julien Dubeda, Hugo Falconet, Ewan Gwine, Josh Prefer, and Shin Sa. And uh, this, this construction of the metric uh, generalized an earlier result, uh, which was really uh, a breakthrough by Jason Miller and Scott Sheffield, which constructed the metric for the special value of the parameter gamma equals square root of eight thirds, which actually plays uh, a very special role in the theory. Um, so I will tell you, uh, I will start by telling you a little bit about uh, the, the volume measure because it's the easiest uh, object to construct and to explain how this works. Uh, and that will give you, I hope, a flavor of uh, what is this random uh, geometry. So, well, we, the, the idea is uh, maybe quite simple in principle. Uh, we cannot assign pointwise values to the Gaussian free field. So instead, what we can do is we can regularize the Gaussian free field. So we're going to consider h epsilon of z. So that's going to be some regularization of the free field for convenience. Often uh, people choose to be uh, uh, choose it to be the circle uh, average uh, of the free field. So you you just consider the average value of the field at a distance epsilon from a point z, and this turns out to be actually well defined. But uh, you know, this is just one choice of renormalization and actually uh, of regularization. And actually, you could uh, think of different uh, choices. And the theorem, uh, which was proved uh, in various forms by uh, various authors, uh, but maybe it's uh, important to mention the work of uh, Kahan in 1985, because really this uh, goes back to, uh, to his theory of Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And then this was uh, rediscovered by Duplanty and Sheffield in their landmark investigation explaining uh, how to think of reveal quantum gravity from a probabilistic point of view. And then uh, uh, further discussed in works by uh, Shamov and myself around 2017. Uh, then the, the idea was to say, well, uh, so what we're going to do is uh, consider this epsilon regularization of the Gaussian free field exponentiates that and view that as a random measure we can integrate that and we can then let try to let try to let epsilon tend to zero. And of course, if you do that, then you will have to uh, renormalize things appropriately. And that turns out to be the right renormalization. And so this, this uh, limit that you get is a measure, it's a random measure, uh, which is called the Gaussian multiplicative chaos associated to the Gaussian free field. And uh, Rather than uh, trying to explain uh, things about it, uh, uh, a picture is worth 100 words easily. And there's going to be three pictures. So you can imagine how many words I'm putting in there. Uh, so here's a nice visualization of reveal measure. This is due uh, a simulation due to Remy Hod. And um, uh, what, what this shows is uh, an approximation of the density of uh, uh, this Liouville measure with respect to Lebesgue measure. I mean, of course, this density is actually infinite in reality. So this is a density of the measure for a small, uh, a small epsilon for which actually uh, this density uh, exists and is finite. So, uh, so you see the, uh, a picture of this uh, approximate density, if you like. And here we've got a, a value uh, gamma equals 0 0.2. And as you can uh, guess, then you, you get uh, some object that's uh, very spiky. Even though when gamma is very small, we should expect to have a measure that's actually very close to Lebesgue measure. Now, when I increase the value of gamma, uh, the peaks, they become more and more pronounced. And uh, I get an object that looks uh, more and more uh, uh, degenerate. And uh, it turns out that uh, 
there is a critical value of the parameter gamma, which is gamma is equal to two. And beyond this value, the, the measure actually degenerates and, and you get something that is uh, zero. But for smaller value of gamma, the, the measure exists and is non-trivial. And so here, this is a simulation uh, of this density for uh, gamma equals 1.8, so very close to the critical value. Okay, so uh, my next uh, uh, task is to tell you about uh, Liouville uh, Brownian motion, and because that's uh, the, one of the main topics of this talk. And uh, if you want, you know, the, the, the question again is how would you define a canonical uh, Brownian motion in this random geometry? And if we were dealing with uh, Riemannian uh, geometry, there is a standard uh, procedure to do that. Really, the, the metric defined what's called a smooth connection, so a way of differentiating function, if you want. And that induces uh, a Laplace operator, uh, delta, and uh, Brownian motion on the manifold is then you know, defined in terms of this Laplacian. Uh, uh, that's the generator, the infinitesimal generator of the process. And of course, in this context, in this random geometry, uh, you know, we can sort of forget about this approach because uh, it seems a bit hopeless to try and differentiate uh, things. Uh, so I think you, 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 know, you, you have to invent something else. And so uh, this was uh, something that was done in two simultaneous papers. Uh, uh, the papers uh, have appeared in different dates because of uh, uh, different uh, uh, procedures in different journals. But there was one paper by myself and another one by uh, Christophe Garban, Rémi Rode, and Vincent Vargas. And uh, the idea was uh, to do regularization <laughs> of the procedure again. Uh, I'm using uh, here their formulation, the formulation in the paper by Garban, Rode, and Vargas, which is maybe slightly easier to, to explain at first. Uh, in any way, their paper goes uh, much deeper than mine. So the idea was uh, if you want to define the uh, uh, appropriate diffusion in, in this geometry, then informally or, or formally, maybe uh, I should say, then we would want to uh, consider an isotropic process. So the the the, the dz, the, the value of the process, the way it changes in, in a small increments of time, should be proportional to uh, the way a Brownian motion moves. But uh, the amplitude of this Brownian motion is changed according to a factor, which is roughly e to the minus gamma. Uh, over two, that just a uh, way to scale things, uh, times the Gaussian free field. And in reality, uh, we have to do something similar to what I explained in the case of uh, the Liouville measure. Namely, uh, you know, the, we, we consider first a regularization of the Gaussian free field H epsilon. And you have to scale this uh, appropriately. This turns out to be the right factor. And maybe another way to uh, uh, restate uh, what this definition is, is simply that I can start with a Brownian motion B in the domain of the complex plane. And uh, I define this function phi epsilon of T, which is just the integral from zero to T exponential of uh, gamma times the Gaussian free field at the point B of the Brownian motion times dS. So I call this the clock of uh, Liouville Brownian motion. And then by definition, the uh, epsilon regularized Liouville Brownian motion is just uh, the Brownian motion B time changed by the inverse of this clock. And uh, the theorem uh, that, that's contained uh, in these papers, and as I said, uh, th th this paper, the second paper by uh, Garban Rode Vargas actually goes much deeper than, than that, says that the, the limit exists uh, on, on, compacts, uh, on compacts of time. Uh, in probability, say, as epsilon tends to zero. Uh, so, so this gives you an idea of uh, uh, how you would want to uh, define liouville brown motion. And at this point, uh, I have something that I want to share, uh, which is a, a video of uh, liouville brown motion. Now, uh, we have tried to uh, share video earlier, and actually we ran into problems uh, when we did some uh, uh, trials with uh, Life and, and Andreas earlier. And so instead, what I will do is I will send you a, a link uh, on the group chat if I manage to find it. Uh, uh, do I manage to find it? Uh, so I have to stop sharing my screen for a second and I will share uh, 
the I will share the, the link uh, to the video. So uh, I have just uh, sent to everyone. No, not to everyone. How do I send it to everyone? Uh, I do not know how to uh, send it to everyone. Uh, 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 put it here. Yeah, well, I'm trying to put it here, but somehow I can. <laughs> uh, uh, there we are. No. Drop down menu. <laughs> this is annoying. I can <laughs> I can only send a private chat for some reason to Christophe Garvan. <laughs> send it to Christophe, and perhaps Christophe can send to all. So maybe Christophe, if you know how to send it, uh, you can you can send it to everyone. Uh, send it to me uh, into field. Yeah, I don't know why. Oh yeah, because uh, it's there. Yeah. Ah, to everyone. There we are. Thank you, Christophe. And and here, here is the, the link again. So uh, you, can, uh, you can send to everyone, uh, you, everyone, you, you can go to this. This is a YouTube video, uh, which was made by uh, Henry Jackson uh, some years ago. Henry Jackson is, is a former PhD student of mine. Uh, and uh, he, he made this, I think, beautiful simulation of Liouville Brown emotion. Um, I, will, I will play it for myself as well, um, even though I have looked at it many, many times. Uh, uh, what you see on this video uh, is, is uh, a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, you see a green mountainous landscape. Uh, that's the value of the Gaussian free field. And uh, you see also on top of that, um, uh, uh, you see on top of that a, a particle uh, uh, moving on this mountainous landscape. So I see some people saying that uh, uh, you, you can only see my face, and that's because you, in order to see the video, you have to uh, go to YouTube and, and follow the link that I've ma finally managed to send on, on, the, on the group chat. Uh, so this is an amazing video. Uh, you, you, I will give everyone the chance to see it again. Uh, uh, and and uh, yeah, so um, maybe. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, as you can see, this, this particle uh, likes to spend time on top of, a, of, of mountains. And uh, the, the reason why that's the case is not because it's attracted somehow to the top of the mountains, but uh, rather uh, because um, uh, when, when it finds itself on top of a mountain, it is slowing down uh, uh, so much that it looks like it, it's uh, just, just uh, you know, it's, it's hanging out there. So I hope everyone uh, uh, has uh, seen the video and try to uh, get a feel for, uh, for what this uh, process is doing. Uh, for now, I will, I will return to, uh, to my slides. Uh, and and uh, I will tell you a little bit. There's one about... question. We could try a question. There is a question. Sorry, I didn't see this. So if you raise your hand, you're going to the top and we're going to unmute you. Let's see. Raising hands doesn't work. Perhaps you can read the question yourself in the chat. Uh, yes, so. Oh. Actually, it's not easy for me to read the questions in the chat for some reason, maybe I can. Okay, let's. The question is in, in simulation, it keeps moving because people keep writing things. In simulation, mountain can go deep under the plane. Can random walk go there? In the simulation, mountain can the random walk go into the deep crevices? Yes, that's right. So, so th there's really two things that's happening. So, really, the, the trajectory itself. Maybe I, I explained this uh, too quickly. Maybe you can still see it in the slides. The trajectory itself is just a time change of Brownian motion. It has no preferred direction. It is completely isotropic. Uh, but uh, what, what is happening is that it can move more or less quick depending on the values of the free field. Uh, so that's exactly the meaning of this clock. Uh, the clock uh, phi, phi epsilon of t makes it move more or less quick depending on how high the field is. So when, um, uh, w when the field is very high, then uh, the, 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 the uvil brownian motion is actually slowing down and spending a lot of time. And really, if you think about it, it's because you sort of have 
packed a lot of triangle into a small area. And so that's why really, you know, little brown motion will, will spend a lot of time uh, there before it, it moves elsewhere. Conversely, uh, it can also find itself in places where uh, the, the field is just very low. And in those places, the, the Brownian motion will actually move extremely quickly. Uh, so it will see these points if you want, but just spend very little time there. And uh, uh, so, so, um, so thanks. Th these, questions, uh, uh, these questions are very useful. I see that somebody asking a question, are the peaks supposed to, dec to denote local maxima? So maybe I should explain again what, what this was. This was a regularization of the Gaussian free field because we cannot give pointwise values to the field. And uh, uh, so, of course, you know, the absolute top peak will be uh, local maxima, but only of this regularization. Uh, so in reality, um, yeah, so, so uh, in fact, this is a, a good way to uh, come back to my slides and tell you a little bit more uh, properties of this level brown motion. So there are various properties uh, that we know, uh, many of which uh, were proved uh, uh, in, in the paper that I mentioned by, Ga by Christophe Garban, Rémi Rod, and Vincent Vargas, or another uh, follow-up paper that they had after, uh, and uh, also another paper by uh, Rémi and Vincent, Rémi Rod and Vincent Vargas, uh, one paper by myself, and another paper by uh, uh, this PhD student, former PhD student of mine that I've mentioned, Henry Jackson. Uh, one property that we know, for instance, is that this uh, process has continuous uh, trajectories and uh, does not uh, stay stuck. So this might seem obvious, but actually, uh, if you think about it, the, the mountains might be so high that, uh, uh, you know, the, the brown motion wants to kind of stay stuck there and does not want to leave uh, the peak. And in some sense, that is actually what happens when gamma becomes greater than two. Uh, the mountains are so high that just brown motion never leaves uh, never leaves this, uh, these positions. Um, I see that somebody raised their hand. Uh, I don't know if it's possible to uh, um, make them unmute themselves. Yeah, I'm not seeing the raised hand. Okay. Uh, so may maybe group chat is easier uh, for people to, uh, to ask questions if they want to. I would hold the questions till the end, just for the sake of context. Okay, all right. So just because maybe there's uh, too many people, maybe questions uh, are best uh, left till the end. Um, so another property that we know is that you will measure, the measure I introduced a few slides ago, is actually almost surely invariant for uh, Liouville brown emotion, uh, given, the, given the free field. Uh, so this is an indication, if you want, that we are really looking um, uh, we are really looking at the right uh, object. Uh, another uh, property that we know is that it actually spends, uh, th this process spends all its time in a set of uh, Lebesgue measure zero. So that's quite weird. Uh, um, by all its time, I should say that, uh, you know, Lebesgue all of its time, uh, almost all of its time in a set of Lebesgue measure zero. And that's because it spends most of its time in places where the free field is gonna be unusually high. And uh, so, so, so that's you know, one, one reason why that's the case. Another weird uh, property of Liouville brown motion, at least weird to me, is that when gamma becomes a bit greater than square root two, so this is uh, still less than the critical value for which things make sense. I remind you that the critical value for, for things to make sense is gamma equals two. So gamma can be greater than square root two. Uh, for gamma greater than square root two, the trajectory actually has zero derivative at almost every time, and that's, uh, related again to the same phenomenon that it likes to spend places uh, time at these places where the free field is very high. So there are uh, the, the, there are mountains that are quite high, and these really slow down a lot the process. Not quite enough that the process would stay stuck, but enough that the uh, there is zero derivative at almost every time. Uh, finally, another uh, remarkable property of this process is that the the spectral dimension. Uh, was rigorously computed by uh, this paper of uh, uh, Rémi uh, Rode and Vincent Vargas, and they confirmed this uh, conjecture of Ambion and Watabiki that the spectral dimension really is two almost surely, meaning uh, that if you look at the uh, on-diagonal transition probability of Liouville brown emotion, then PTXX uh, behaves to the first order that is up to logarithmic terms like uh, one over T.
as t tends to infinity. Um, right, so, so this was a, a very brief introduction to louisville brown motion, which uh, is a candidate for the scaling limits of random walks on planar maps. Um, I want to tell you, to start telling you a bit about uh, the results that we proved. And uh, for this, oops, for this, the first thing that I need to do is to try to uh, tell you about uh, potential connections between uh, discrete uh, con uh, side of the story and the continuum side of the story. And by discrete, I mean random planar maps. And by continuum, I mean Gaussian free field. Uh, so, you know, physicists, because of this DDK ansatz that I've mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, which was explained to us by Duplantier and Sheffield, uh, uh, really, uh, uh, it is, you know, largely believed that these two stories should be two sides of the same coin. And if you want to try and, uh, uh, and, and say this rigorously, then the first thing you need to do is you need to find a good way to uh, draw your planar maps in a Euclidean space. And uh, the, the reason uh, this is necessary is because the planar map really is a combinatorial object. So I, I never gave a definition of planar maps, and maybe I should. Uh, a planar map is really just, uh, is very similar to the notion of planar graph. The planar graph is a graph that you can draw on, on, the, on the plane in such a way that the edges don't cross one another. And a planar map is, uh, is very similar. It's basically uh, the idea of a, of, a, of a planar graph that you have drawn in the plane in some particular way uh, that you considered up to a homeomorphism of the plane or on the sphere if you're doing this on the sphere, which may be more, more natural, depending on the context. Uh, so, um, so the, the fact that we consider it drawn into the plane, but up to homeomorphism just means really that we are still considering a, a combinatorial object. It is not a particular drawing that we consider. It's a, it's a drawing up to homeomorphism, meaning that uh, I can draw my map in the plane in a way, and I can move the edges in, in, in some arbitrary way. And for me, that will still be the same planar map. Um, so, um, uh, so, so finding a, a canonical way of drawing uh, pl uh, planar maps in a plane is actually an important question if you want to try to relate the discrete and the continuum stories, because the continuum stories, they, they, they make reference to specific positions of points in the plane. Uh, so the, there are you know, many ways you can do that. Uh, there is the Riemann mapping theorem provides a way, the uniformization, I should say. Uh, something that is very popular and leads to very beautiful pictures, uh, one of which uh, was shown as the first slide of my talk, is a circle packing theorem. This picture, by the way, was due to Jason Miller, um, uh, who has many amazing pictures on his webpage. Um, and uh, uh, so, so the circle packing theorem provides one way. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about tot embedding because it's going to be more relevant to the rest of my, my talk. And, the, the, the tot embedding, uh, uh, whether you, you speak, uh, well, I should say that this tot embedding comes in two flavors. There's either the, the flavor for infinite maps or, or the flavor, flavor for finite maps with the, uh, with the, with the, with the boundary. So I will talk uh, briefly about uh, the tot embedding for finite maps with a, with a boundary. And uh, so this is what you see on this picture, also due to uh, Jason Miller. And uh, uh, what, what you can see here is a large random triangulation with a big boundary. So the, the, the boundary vertices are, 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 have been drawn here. And um, um, so a tot embedding of this triangulation is just a drawing of the, of the graph in such a way that uh, the, if you do a random walk on this graph, then the position of the random walk will by definition be a, a martingale. Uh, so another way to put it, of course, is that uh, the uh, position of any vertex must be equal to the average value of the positions of its neighboring vertices. So it's not very complicated to see that you can do that, simply because once you've prescribed uh, positions uh, for the boundary vertices, you can simply uh, solve the discrete Dirichlet problem uh, with this boundary data. And uh, you know, the solution of the Dirichlet problem will tell you where to put the vertices. 
And if you do that, then of course, by definition, uh, then, then every vertices will be the average of its neighbors. Now, the, the remarkable thing, uh, which is a, a theorem of Tut, is that actually if you uh, do that and also draw edges a straight line, you will get a, a planar realization of your planar graph. Uh, and so that means that a straight segment uh, drawn in this fashion will have the property that they don't cross one another. They might be uh, tangent to one another, but they will not cross one another. Uh, so that's a, a beautiful theorem of that. And uh, so that, that uh, you know, the fact that random walk on this uh, graph is by definition a martingale, it, of course, is a very nice property. It, it says that it's a canonical way of drawing uh, the graph on the plane. Okay, I see that uh, on the group chats, there are still many people asking questions about uh, Liouville Brown motion and uh, uh, a high point of the Gaussian free field. So may maybe these questions can be deferred uh, to the end. I'll be more than happy to take uh, plenty. Nat, I think they, they've started discussing among themselves and answering each other's questions. Yeah, your friends nice. answered most of the questions. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, we don't need you. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> um, so, so that's the third embedding. Uh, once we've got a, a good way of drawing uh, graphs in, in a plane, it makes sense to uh, uh, ask questions about relating uh, the discrete and the continuum stories. And here's a big conjecture, which uh, I think at this stage today is still uh, quite far open, uh, quite wide open. And so, so here's what it says. So let's take Tn, some uniform random triangulation, say with n faces or, or say with a boundary as I did uh, just above. Let psi be some nice embedding of this triangulation into the plane. For instance, it could be circle packing or it could be the third embedding that I discussed. Uh, let mu n be the mass measure putting uh, mass one over n at each center. Okay, yeah, I really should have said that each uh, vertex uh, of the graph. And uh, one conjecture that you can make is that as n tends to infinity, uh, this, this measure converges uh, at least to a variant uh, of Liouville measure for the specific uh, value of the parameter gamma, which is square root eight thirds. I've already mentioned actually that uh, uh, this, this value plays a special role in the, in the theory. And moreover, if you were to do a simple random walk on your graph embedded in this nice way, then uh, the, the uh, image of the random walk under this embedding would converge uh, after uh, scaling of uh, space and time towards Liouville brown in motion. And so, uh, um, I'm, I, I finally got to a stage where I could uh, at least tell you what was the question we were trying to uh, uh, approach with you and Gwine in this paper uh, that I want to tell you about. Um, so, uh, right. So, uh, so here's the, the main result. At least I will tell you the punchline uh, of the result and uh, uh, later I will try to uh, say more precise version of this uh, punchline. Maybe uh, life, you should also tell me how much time I've got at this stage because I didn't really pay attention to- the Since you're time. the second speaker, there's no problem, I guess. Oh. So, <laughs> so I can speak for one hour, right? <laughs> yeah, just- <laughs> No, I won't speak for one more hour. Um, 10 minutes or so? 10 minutes, yeah, right. So, so I will try to, to do that. Thank you. So the, the punchline uh, of this, uh, uh, paper that we put on the archive just a couple of days with Yuan Guan is that we proved the first such result for a class of planar maps uh, called mated CRT planar maps. Uh, by this, I mean we proved the first result where we show that uh, uh, random walk uh, embedded, uh, random walks on this graph embedded in an S way, meaning basically that, that embedding converges uh, to Louisville Brown in motion. Uh, I will tell you about these mated CRT planar maps. Uh, they are uh, really remarkable planar maps. Uh, uh, re there, there are sort of two ways you can think about them. And these two ways are very different from one another and they tell you two very different things. Uh, the first one, uh, the, the first way you can think about this mated CRT planar maps is as a very nice uh, discretization of Liouville quantum gravity. So maybe uh, you can think that these are uh, planar maps that are devised so that they are close to Liouville quantum gravity. 
uh, and of course, so, so they are, you know, uh, the first candidates you should uh, uh, try in order to try and prove uh, uh, any limiting uh, results of the kind that I've mentioned. Uh, so that's the first, uh, the first approach. And the second approach uh, is, looks very different uh, on the surface. And uh, I, will, I will not say much about it because it takes time. Uh, but what is very nice about this second approach is that it gives you a way of uh, re trying to relate uh, more natural models of random planar maps uh, to these uh, mated CRT planar maps. So you can view them and sometimes rigorously view them as coarse grained versions of, of, of uh, more natural objects such as UIPT. Um, so, uh, so here's a bit more about these this, uh, mated CRT maps. Uh, again, uh, maybe I've hinted at this already when I said it depended a little bit uh, in, in terms of embedding whether we considered finite maps with a boundary or infinite maps with no boundary. And again, these mated CRT maps, they come with at least two flavors. Uh, in fact, more than that. I will restrict myself to these two flavors. One is the finite, uh, finite type of planar maps with a boundary. And so this corresponds to maps with the topology of a disk, basically a simply connected domain uh, with a boundary. Or uh, they can be infinite without a boundary, meaning that they correspond to the topology of the sphere, or if you want the whole plane, the compactified plane. Uh, so for each of these two cases, there will be, as, as, as I've hinted at, two descriptions, two equivalent description. One which is uh, related to, uh, directly related to level quantum gravity, where you can really see that it's a, a uh, a nice discretization of UV quantum gravity. And another one, which is really very different, feels completely different, uh, which is a topological gluing of a pair of continuous random trees. Uh, so uh, th this second description takes more time to explain. And I won't, uh, uh, I won't try to do that because it will uh, take too much time. Uh, but they are uh, two very different approaches. The fact that these two approaches are the same uh, our equivalent is due to uh, very deep work of Duplantier, Miller, and Sheffield uh, called the, 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 the mating, of tree, mating of tree approach to level quantum gravity. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about uh, just this uh, description one, the, the first way to describe this uh, uh, mated CRT planar maps. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, so this is, is maybe easy to describe especially if you're a bit familiar with uh, SLE and, 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 uh, and Gaussian free field or, or level quantum gravity. So uh, we, we start, we're going to start with fixing a parameter gamma between zero and two. Maybe at this point I should emphasize that uh, uh, I've sort of advertised a bit more of the case gamma equals square root of eight thirds, but actually the result I'm about to state is valid for any gamma between zero and two. That's the whole range of values for which we expect uh, these things to make sense nicely. At this point, and uh, uh, we're going to start with H uh, being something called a quantum cone. Now, a quantum cone takes a bit of work to define uh, very uh, carefully, so uh, I don't want to do that very carefully. But uh, a good way to approximate a quantum cone or to have a picture of what is a quantum cone is basically a Gaussian free field in the full plane uh, to which you've added uh, a term uh, of the form gamma times log one over z where gamma is your, your parameter between zero and two, and z is just uh, the, the point in the complex plane at which you evaluate uh, your, your distribution. So h is not exactly, I should say, really this, uh, this formula, but, but close enough. And it's, uh, it's called the quantum cone. It's basically just a Gaussian free field plus gamma times the logarithmic singularity at the origin. And uh, we also consider eta an independent uh, space filling SLE curve with parameter kappa given by kappa equals 16 over gamma squared. Now, uh, because gamma is between zero and two, uh, gamma squared is between zero and four. And so 16 over gamma squared is between four and infinity. And if you're a little familiar with SLE, you will know that uh, for, for kappa greater than four, uh, SLE is a curve uh, which uh, touches itself, and in fact, for kappa greater than eight uh, is, is actually space filling. So uh, here, what we consider is the space filling version of uh, SLE kappa 
whatever the value of uh, kappa between uh, four and infinity. So when kappa is actually greater than, than uh, eight, this corresponds to gamma being smaller than square root two, then actually space filling SLE kappa is just ordinary uh, SLE kappa. Uh, but when kappa is between four and eight, then, uh, then the definition of SLE needs to be modified a little bit uh, in order to get the space filling SLE. Actually, it's not trivial. Uh, to, to come up with a definition of space filling SLE. But it has been done uh, in some uh, earlier work of Jason uh, Miller and Scott Sheffield on uh, imaginary geometry. So at any rate, we've got this uh, curve. It's possible to define it. And it is space filling. It's independent of this uh, quantum cone, the, the Gaussian free field plus a logarithmic similarity at the origin. And uh, the way we're going to uh, get a graph, uh, G epsilon, with uh, these two data is the following thing. We're going to uh, uh, break the plane into cells. Uh, right, so this is not the right, uh, uh, the right way to describe it. I'm, I apologize for that. I'm going to break it into cells. Maybe you can see it on this picture a little bit. Uh, in, into cells in such a way that each cell has a mass, uh, mu h, uh, in terms of mu h, uh, of size epsilon. So I, I you know, run my uh, space filling SLE curve and I wait until I've covered epsilon amount of mass where the mass is measured according uh, to the exponential of the Gaussian free field. And that gives me one cell of the graph. And then I keep going and I, I, I run the SLE curve a bit more until I've covered epsilon amount of mass again. And that gives me a new cell for, for, for this. So if I, if I run it in the full plane, so here the picture is, is written in the disk, but actually you should imagine this picture in the full plane. Uh, when, uh, when, when, you, uh, when you do this uh, construction uh, in the full plane, then what you have done is you have broken up the entire plane into regions, each of which uh, measure epsilon in terms of the exponential of the Gaussian free field. So, uh, so this is a, a way of breaking up the plane into cells. And to get a graph out of that, I will just uh, simply put a, a vertex at the center of each cell and declare uh, vertices to be adjacent if the, if the, if the cells are, are adjacent. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's the way these mated CRT maps uh, can be defined. Uh, at least that's one description of these mated CRT maps. Maybe it's already clear from uh, the way I've described them that they are, they are made to be a nice discretization of uh, Liouville quantum gravity. Uh, there is a second description of this, uh, uh, of this mated CRT uh, uh, maps. I, I, I don't want to say much about it, but just to give you a flavor of what it is, uh, you will see that it looks totally different from what I've just said. We can consider a pair of correlated two-sided Brownian motions, L and R, uh, whose covariance or whose correlation coefficient is given by minus the cosine of four pi over gamma squared. And these two Brownian motions can be used to define continuous random trees, and these continuous random trees can be glued topologically in some appropriate way. And that turns out it's really not uh, obvious to see, but it's a deep fact uh, to do with uh, this paper of Duplantier, Miller, and Sheffield that this actually describes the same object. And uh, the, the, the reason why these maps are interesting is because there are these bijections uh, relating uh, many models of planar maps uh, to, to something close to this second description. So I will uh, just state my result and, and then we'll uh, stop here, I think, because it will be time. And the statement of the result, when I've done it, uh, so I, I, I start with this uh, graph G epsilon that I've described above, this mated CRT maps, uh, starting from the point Z uh, in the complex plane. Uh, and uh, I linearly interpolate. I, I rescale it uh, in such a way that uh, uh, it will take of uh, basically it will take of order uh, one to uh, leave a macroscopic region for this random walk once it's embedded uh, appropriately. So uh, I, I look at the time it takes for the random walk to leave a ball of radius a half. That's just what we take. And uh, once it's been embedded appropriately and uh, we just rescale time by this uh, factor. Uh, and the, uh, 
the, the theorem that I want that, that I want to, to to wanted everyone to to see, uh, and which is you can find on the archive in this paper with Yuan Guan, uh, says that for any z, if I look at the conditional law of the embedding of the walk, speed up by uh, by by this uh, time scale, um, then uh, this will converge us in probability uh, towards the rescaled law of uh, liouville born motion with parameter gamma uh, starting from Z associated with this uh, quantum cone. Actually, uh, this is also true uh, in the this case if we uh, are considering the TUT embedding. Okay, so I think uh, I'm basically running out uh, of time. So rather than going into a rough sketch of the argument, which will take much uh, way too much time, then uh, I will simply uh, uh, stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, so unfortunately, many of uh, the questions were answered by your friends, but I guess there might be still uh, questions left. And I think one question was not completely answered. So we try, as we said in the beginning, uh, have a look at um, this button, raise your hand in this uh, participation uh, window. And I'm, I'm going to unmute you. Or alternatively, I could also mute everybody and we hope that not 10 people are going to ask at the same time. What do you think? <laughs> Ooh, dangerous. <laughs> okay. If somebody wants to ask a question, just go for it. Why I sent it to you. I think that we've not been really good. It doesn't work. Too noisy, yeah. This doesn't work. Um, so, my impression was that many questions have already been answered. So, oh yeah, there's a hand. Okay, yeah, you should be able to ask. Uh, okay, let me try then. Maybe it's just a very simple question. In, but for one-dimensional diffusions, you have this concept of a speed measure. And um, which tells you basically, like if you have a one-dimensional martingale, you only have to say how fast it exits a certain interval. And if you know that for every interval that tells, that is what the speed measure tells you, then you basically know which one you have. And I wondered if for isotropic diffusions in the plane, you could do something similar. Mod if this is basically what is happening here with this, this special measure UH. I think that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's basically right, right? That's uh, ju just just I mean, basically what it is 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 uh, is, is a form of Dubin-Schwarz theorem, right? It's isotropic and and you know moves at uh, uh, equal speed in all directions. So so um, so 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 Dubin-Schwarz just tells you that you should be able to express your diffusion in a situation like that as a time change of Brownian motion where the time change involved just a quadratic variation. And if you want, you can think that the Liouville clock that I mentioned in my talk um, uh, just, just defines the quadratic variation of your process effectively. So ba basically that, that's right. So if you've got uh, something that is isotropic in the sense that I've just described, right? That the, uh, it has no preferred direction, it's a martingale and, and the quadratic variation in, in every direction is the same. Uh, and, and of course, you know, so you need really, isotropy really means also that the, the cross variation will be zero, then, then by definition you get exactly, exactly that. You, you get, that's, I think that's called the Knight theorem, uh, which is really just a, a generalization of the dubin schwartz So basically that's right. Okay, thanks. Okay, next one is Milton. So I changed the option, so now everybody can unmute him or herself. Next one is Milton. Okay, so uh, when people look at the diffusion in fractals, um, actually what they do is that uh, they, they try to define this uh, Carhaix du Champ measure. Mm -hmm. And once you have this measure, you can just uh, use uh, the theory of Dirichlet forms to, to, uh, to define Brownian motion of this object. Uh, is there a strategy here that 
analogous to that somehow? Right, so I should say that uh, uh, I'm, I'm really not the expert for, for this. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Christophe, uh, Rémy or Vincent uh, would be much better at answering this question than me. They have, uh, in their paper, they, they do discuss uh, the Jewish reform approach to uh, living born emotion. Uh, I think in practice here, it would be uh, very hard to uh, uh, directly relate the Jewish reform. Uh, so, uh, so, so in fact, our, our approach does not use uh, does not use this uh, directly. I don't know if I've answered your question, uh, Milton. That's okay. There's another question in the chat, but I fear it's already answered again by your friends. Can you see it? Uh, oh, right, right. Do you use uh, bijection machinery in your proofs? Um, uh, so, not not uh, not really. No. So, I mean, the the, the proof uh, that we have is uh, based on uh, sort of two two things. I mean, you know, it's a sort of tightness plus characterization uh, uh, type of argument. Uh, I, I think you know uh, uh, several of these several aspects of this uh, uh, of these proofs are. It's, it's quite modular, and I hope it's quite generic. So. Uh, you know, we're hoping that some aspects of this proof uh, will uh, be useful when we try to talk about convergence on, on other models of random planar maps. It does not really rely so much on, uh, uh, um, yeah, bijections. It's more to do with, uh, on the one hand, uh, sort of energy estimates, I would say, to try and, uh, and get some uh, tightness. And on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, a, a characterization of uvil brown emotion, um, which, uh, which roughly says that uh, there is a unique uh, Markov process uh, whose law is a continuous function of its starting point, uh, is Markovian, and uh, time change of brown emotion, and leaves Liouville measure uh, invariant. And that's the characterization that we use uh, at the end of the day to uh, uh, prove convergence. There are two more questions. The first seems to be answered already. The second, you're lucky. Okay, so Leandro asks, can the gamma level brown motion be, be defined on the limit for, in the limit for gamma equals two by taking, yeah, right. So uh, Leandro, thank you. That's uh, indeed uh, a definition exists for gamma equals two. That's been done in a paper by uh, Rémi Rod and uh, Vincent Vargas. Uh, right, so I, I uh, uh, in principle, there, there, there is also a, a recent uh, mating of tree approach in the case uh, to level quantum gravity in the case gamma equals to two. Uh, there, there's been two papers, one by uh, Nina Holden and Ellen Powell, uh, which prove uh, a version of the uh, mating of trees uh, story. And uh, uh, I don't know to what extent uh, uh, it might make sense to try and, uh, and, and prove, uh, I have not thought about it, about the case gamma equals two for the scaling limits of random walk. It's a natural question, obviously. So it looks like there are no more questions. Uh, so thank you very much again, Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Andreas. It's, it's not so easy to give a talk in just a computer camera without any people around. So thanks for being the first uh, for trying this.